morning. Welcome, YouTube. Now, if I can just get the guys on the floor to calm down. What? I, I, am I on? a big round of applause. That was loud and wonderful. And let there be light. What is our church's mission? To embody God's powerful love, welcoming all people with a vision and a message of hope. in the call to worship. 
One God, you have, us, you have called us to the mountaintop. Christ, too, calls us to the mountaintop to receive a new vision. Help us to listen closely to words of your healing love. Open our hearts and spirits to receive your glorious directions. Let us place our trust and hope in God, for God is our true God. Let us open ourselves to God, ready for the vision God places before us. Amen. God, thank you for this beautiful day to have us all together here to pray in your name and hope the reading is about you and all the things that happen in the world today and every day and pray for everybody that is going through a hard times, troubled times, sickness. Amen. How great is our God. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of Good morning. This morning's gospel reading is from Matthew uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, we will set us up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Today is Transfiguration Sunday in the church's calendar. That's why I put white up front. Uh, the passages that we read from the Bible are full of mountaintops, clouds, fire, voices from an unseen person or deity, dead people coming back and looking pretty good and talking as if it was all normal. Although one of them didn't die, but just went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. 
People shining white and actually glowing light. People prostrate on the ground as they were so struck with awe and fear. A man who is dazzling white turning back to his normal look. How does he do that? I didn't see any costume change up there. And the three witnesses being told to not tell anybody about their supernatural experience. Really? I thought they were supposed to spread the word, tell all. Dead people vanishing, poof. And the man who was dazzling white just casually walking down the mountain with three men following as if nothing extraordinary happened at all. Then they all went about their business of preaching and healing with only their hands and voices. If we didn't know better, it all sounds like fantasy. It's stories like this that are so much a part of our faith and what our faith is built on. And we hear them over and over, and you've heard sermons on Transfiguration Sunday. But often then, because they're familiar, we don't blink an eye when hearing them. We don't think about how out of the ordinary it sounds. We therefore tend to take them more at face value and miss the, the mystical part and miss any relevance to our lives today. Just another Bible story. Just needs a little more props if you're doing it for Sunday school. If that no longer happens, and certainly doesn't happen to any of us today, or does it? The mystical side of life is real. We just don't talk about it very often, at least not in Protestant churches, and at least not in the Western world. And we keep it mired in mystery, as we're aware that if we talk about it, we might be judged for that. Yet we're called to tell and demonstrate to others the good news of the gospel and the mystery that is part of it. There are a lot of people outside of the church walls that say they're spiritual, but not religious. How do we craft our message for them? How do we get comfortable with that mystical side of life so that we can talk about it with others in or out of the church? And all three of the Abrahamic, Abrahamic, whatever, I never can say that word, traditions have mystical branches to them. The Sufis, the Jewish Kabbalists, and the Christian mystics. Jesus would have us embrace it. Jesus wasn't daunted by it, and the transfiguration was a very clear and irrefutable sign to the disciples that Jesus was not only the Son of Man, but he was also the Son of God. What are those mysteries? Fully God, fully human. How do we explain that? And how do we hear these readings today? What do we get from these stories that can be applied to our lives and to those that we encounter? There's a lot of great imagery and connections between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament readings, Isaiah and Matthew. And it's easy to analyze it all with our heads, but the story is really about an experience. And I was in part being funny at the beginning of my sermon, but I, too, I do believe that it's really hard to put into words those experiential moments, those moments when you know God has crossed your path. You know God has intervened in your life. I just know from my years of hospice experience that we all have holy ground that we can walk on every day of our lives. And my, one of the mine that I remember is it didn't involve a burning bush like Moses, you know, take off your shoes. But once I was asked to take my shoes off and put on embroidered slippers when I entered a house. This was a house of a Asian family and was part of their culture. I felt very humble as I put on those sisters, slippers. This was their invitation into their space in their lives as the man faced his death. It's a sacred time and a space as we prepare for our deaths 
or the death of others around us if we have that time. It's a gift to be able to talk and to attend to them, to help them prepare for that transition. Truly an honor to witness the end of their earthly life and to help them say goodbye to each other. And I was changed by witnessing God at work in others' lives. I often felt like I was the instrument in which God worked through me, that I wasn't doing the work. And any sense of otherness melts away. I often felt that I sat with God among us as I sat with other people. A liminal space of relinquishing and letting go. So is this part of what went on at the top of that mountain at transfiguration? Is this what goes on when we encounter God? And this part of the sermon, I really struggled with writing because there really aren't words to experience what I felt. And I can feel that right now by talking about it. But it's hard for me to truly give you that experience. I just know that I've been blessed and transformed by those moments. And it was very common in the Hebrew Bible when people encountered God or were called to do so, they went up on the mountain. And that was also, I mean, the Egyptians, the Romans, their gods, they were up there and you went up to see them. And then in the Old Testament, some of the gods came down and mingled with the humans. That was before Noah. Moses went up onto Mount Sinai to receive the tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. Jesus asked his three closest disciples to go up on that mountain with him as he has something to show them, to experience with them. And a lot had happened to those disciples in a very short period of time because just six days prior, Jesus had laid out his mission to the disciples and outlined to them his betrayal, death, suffering, and his resurrection. That was a lot for the disciples to understandably take in because they didn't know the end of the story. And Peter resisted such that Jesus had to rebuke him. Go away, Satan, Peter was told. But Peter's reaction is a normal first reaction to grief, disbelief, this can't be happening, denial, no, no, to fight against it. So Jesus decides to show them what he's talking about, to help them understand where they're following Jesus to and how it's a part of God's divine overarching purpose. He's giving them that zoom or the wide-angle lens. They're focusing on the Zoom. I don't want this to happen tomorrow. God is saying that's part of this huge purpose I have for you and all my people, including us today. So when the disciples and Jesus got to the particular spot on the mountain, Jesus' appearance changed right before their eyes. Hard to dispute an eyewitness account which that eyewitness account became very big later on. Disputes over somebody who saw it had more authority than those that didn't. And sadly, that quest for authority and power has continued today in our churches. And then out of nowhere appeared both Moses, representing the law, and Elijah, who represented the prophets. Those were the prior leaders of the Jewish people, the Israelites. And God didn't talk directly to many folks, but it was that liminal space, that fine space between the worlds, a space of reverence. And we don't see God directly, but know in other ways that God is presence, present. Our senses tell us, not our head, our senses tell us eyes, ears, our body. We feel it. 
And one cannot be in the presence of God and not be changed. That's just a fact. Jesus was transfigured, meaning he had a change in his outward appearance, synonymous with transformation. Jesus was glowing and wearing dazzling white garments. Moses had glowed too when he went into that inner tabernacle and talked with God and came out. Moses had to wear a veil over his face because the glowing would scare the children. God then speaks out of nowhere, out of this cloud, and states as the angel did when Jesus was baptized by John, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. But then God added, listen to him. Jesus is above the prophets, above the law. Listen to him. Now there's a very long and well-documented history in the Bible of people not listening to God, of people making commitments, covenants, and then breaking them again and again and again. So upon hearing that voice, the three apostles fell prostrate. No broken noses. And they were on the ground out of both awe and fear. They just knew that this was something really big. Wow. And Jesus gave the disciples an experience, all right. And God gave an undeniable message to the disciples that Jesus was the Son of God himself. Jesus is clearly divine. We too are God's children, and we too have a spark of the Holy Spirit in us, in each one of us, in there, just waiting to be lit and to shine out from us. We too will appear with a spiritual body like Jesus when we are at our fullest. People often talk of finding God and how that made such a great difference in their lives that others can see and validate. They can see that change in them, that outward appearance, their manner, their, their actions. And it does and can and will happen to each of us. And I believe that each and every one is capable of having these life-changing, life-transforming experiences. Doesn't matter what label you put on it, you know what you experienced. And I personally use the term Holy Spirit to label it when it happens in my life or when I see it happening to others. And we've done this here in church. It's the Holy Spirit working. Barb was singing to us the other week, the Holy Spirit working. That's just one small example. I, get a lot of, I give a lot of credit to the disciples for keeping quiet as asked to by Jesus, that trust and obey, and going on with their business as usual. Because these experiences with God don't last forever. We have to figure out how do we experience them, but then how do we go back to our daily lives? The toilet still needs to get cleaned. And the time wasn't right until after the resurrection, the denial, the hiding, and the 40 days they had to wait till Pentecost, not knowing what this sign was that was going to come. And then, and only then, could they take it in and remember the transfiguration. And then they had the power of the Holy Spirit to talk about what happened on that mountain, to talk about how they were transformed. And we're still talking about it today and what it means for us today. When people are actively dying, they often reach out and may talk to loved ones that they see. We don't see it. 
but it's true. And I look at that as an experience of the continuity and the fluidity of life and the continuity of God. That's reassuring. We're obviously still living in the afterlife, and it's a bright, wonderful experience, which is testified to by those that get close and then come back. It's a comforting experience when you're dying and you reach out and you know that you are personally reunited with that peace and that love that is eternal. So take a great comfort in those liminal places, large or small, when it opens up and you experience the holy, when you find yourself on holy ground in awe of where you are and the rest of life for that moment fades into the background. Just experience it. Accept it. Don't try and analyze it. It's meant to be felt. It's part of life. Talk about it like John did a few weeks ago when he shared about sitting on his front porch, watching the traffic go by. Next thing he knows, it's quiet. And he experiences God in his life. And then the traffic goes by. That's part of spreading the gospel to talk about that stuff. Let yourself grow spiritually and be transformed by the experience. It doesn't happen for us to ignore or to dismiss. The more you pay attention to such experiences, it's taking my mouth of my voice away from me again. It's not fair, I'm just at the end. Um, the more you pay attention to these experiences, the more they will happen in your life. So tune into the God channel and sit back and just enjoy. And I'll end with John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. And a few verses later, rise, let us be on our way. So go out holding the peace of God in your hearts. Let it shine through. Look for it in others. Amen. A loving, healing God, we humbly come before you today. You've heard the concerns that have been spoken out loud. We ask for healing, for comfort as people approach the end of their life and prepare to see you again in your glory. We ask for people that are undergoing cancer, other illnesses, clots, tumors. May your hands be on those that treat them. May comfort embrace them. May they know that they are not alone and that you guide them and walk with them. Be with us as we transition from those places where we feel close to you and know you, and then go back into the real world, which sometimes feels like it just hits us in the face with the cold, hard reality. Help us to see the world and see others through your eyes. See that divine spark that is in everybody that we encounter, no matter how horrible they treat us or others. May we walk with you every single moment of our lives. May we stay in the presence and fully ex experience life with you, for it is a glorious, wonderful thing. 
in God's name, in Jesus' name, in the Holy Spirit's name, we pray and worship you. Amen. Thank you.